So I've been browsing this sub for a while, and I find everyone's stories so fascinating. I think writing about traumatic instances is very therapeutic, and I appreciate everyone's courage to post theirs here. After a little bit of thought, I realized I might have one to add to the mix. All the names have been changed for anonymity, of course, and some details may be a bit blurry due to the span of time and the traumatic nature of this scenario. The event in question happened during my sophomore year in college, all the way back in 2012. I honestly can't remember the exact month itself, but I believe it was sometime during the winter. I live with two other girls, Katie and Danielle, and we were the best buds of all time. We had just moved into our first off-campus house, and we were reveling in the freedom of being out of the dorms. With this revelry came some experimentation with drugs and alcohol. The three of us started hanging out and partying with a group of people who eventually got into harder drugs, like cocaine, molly, etc. And Katie and I decided after a while that all of this partying was in danger of jeopardizing our health and schoolwork, so we backed off from the drugs. Danielle, however, decided to continue experimenting with a wide variety of drugs, also with continuing frequency and started getting more and more aggressive. I should note that I have no judgment toward drug use whatsoever, but I include it because I believe it's a crucial component to the events that transpired. The saga started on a weekend. Katie, Danielle, and I all went to a party one night and got separated from one another. I had made arrangements with the girls to leave the party early, so Danielle agreed to walk with Katie back to the house. We were always adamant about the buddy system at night, especially when we had been drinking, but it failed that night. Instead, Danielle left the party with someone and left Katie to walk home alone late at night. She was unfortunately followed by a strange man. To this day, I deeply regret leaving that night, but I've come to terms with my past decision and taken responsibility for my choice. I came home the next morning and Katie filled me in on the previous night. She was very upset, which is out of character for her, and told me she had texted Daniel at some point during the night, telling her that she was really upset that she'd left her to walk home alone. Katie was frustrated and her text was quite blunt, but both Katie and I just figured Daniel would either brush it off or apologize and things would move on fairly quickly. That did not happen. Instead, Danielle flipped her shit and became completely enraged. She responded very defensively and told Katie in colorful terms to basically fuck off and get over it. Katie and I thought that was pretty odd and hostile, but trying to just carry on with our days and not overthink it. It was Monday, so Katie left the house to go work on campus, and I went to my afternoon lecture. Sometime while I was in class, unbeknownst to me at the time, Danielle came into Katie's workplace in the student rec center and started screaming at her in front of 60 plus patrons, calling her a boatload of obscenities. She was escorted out of the building by security and somehow made her way back to our house. I should also note that Danielle's mother was visiting this week and was with Danielle the entire time. I believe she was terrified of her own daughter, which is why she never intervened. By the time she arrived home, I had returned from class and was making food in the kitchen. At this juncture, Danielle's rage was centered on Katie, not me, so I tried to let the two of them work it out without my intervention. Danielle cornered me in the kitchen and told me how angry she was with Katie and what a fucking bitch she was. I had never before seen rage in someone's eyes like that. I refused to engage with her and retreated to my room in the back of the house. I sat on my bed and took some deep breaths when I heard Katie coming up the side yard. She was crying on the phone with her mom, telling her what had just taken place at work. I immediately felt this horrible pit in my stomach as I knew there was about to be another confrontation again. The door opened and Katie walked in. I was still in my room when I heard them start yelling at each other. Katie stood up for herself, telling Danielle she was way out of line, and Danielle retorted with more obscenities. The yelling turned into full-on screaming, and I'd finally had enough of it. I went to the living room where Danielle, Katie, and Danielle's mom were standing. 
I told Danielle to knock it off and leave, to which he told me to go fuck myself. This gave Katie time to try and bolt into her room, but Danielle followed her and slammed Katie's hand in the door as she was trying to barricade herself. I went outside on our front porch, and Katie got past Danielle and followed me outside. A few seconds later, I heard Danielle's mom screaming, No! Danielle, put it down! I turned to Katie, and we looked at each other in terror. I told her to run away and call 911. At that moment, Danielle flung open the front door holding a giant knife raised above her head. She yelled something like, Bitch, I'm going to kill you, to Katie. Again, I can't remember the exact words because it was so terrifying. By this time, all our neighbors were standing outside, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. I'm not exactly a confrontational person, but fuck if I was going to let someone kill my best friend. In a split-second decision, I lunged at Danielle and somehow managed to wrestle the knife from her and threw it onto the front lawn. I ran after it to grab it, and during that time, Danielle had gone back inside to grab another knife. This time, she turned it on herself, though. She asked me if I wanted to watch her slit her own throat on our porch. Her mother was hysterical, and I kept saying to her, No, Danielle, we love you. Please, don't do it. At some point, I blacked out. When I came to, I was running with Katie down the street into our neighbor's house for refuge. All the while, I could still hear Danielle's blood-curdling screams echoing down the street. We were totally shell-shocked, but bless those guys for taking care of us until the police came. We saw the cops show up with a crisis unit, and they detained her and drove her to the hospital, where she was put on a psych hold. Katie and I never saw Danielle again. We stayed with our friends for a few weeks before returning to our house. We moved out at the end of the year, as it harbored too many somber feelings. I later learned that Danielle may have experienced a psychotic episode triggered by a variety of factors, including stress, recent drug use, and an underlying mental health condition. I'll never know why she did this, however. Speculation doesn't exactly matter at this point. It was a huge eye-opener for me, though, to further educate myself about mental health in young adults, as well as to appreciate the incredible things your body can do when you're in fight-or-flight mode. It also taught me to listen to my gut more, as my spidey senses had tingled around Danielle before, but I'd always just ignore it. So my dad runs a tree removal business out of our backyard, and has been since I was a baby. When I was five, we moved to a house with almost five acres of property, so he could park his work trucks, use wood chippers, and split and pile firewood comfortably. As a child, my brother and I loved playing near that. So my house is a little ways down a long driveway, and the driveway continues a bit. Then there's a garage with a little apartment attached. At this time, a couple my parents were friends with rented this apartment, and this was about 50 yards away from the main house. Fast forward to when I was 10 years old. My brother was 13 at the time. Also something to note, my dad's employees aren't exactly admirable people. Ex-addicts, thieves, I don't even know truthfully. But I do know that the workers always came and went. It's, uh... Obviously not the best of jobs. To work in the hot summer months and then have no work during the winter. Anyway, my dad hired these two brothers who were in their early 20s. One of them, I remember, was very good looking, and his brother seemed dorky to me and wore glasses. Ten-year-old me didn't pay too much attention, obviously. All I wanted to do was climb the wood piles in my backyard. Well, one day after school, I remember my mom saying it was too chilly to play outside and to stay inside instead. I remember this so vividly. I literally remember what I was wearing and even how I wanted my favorite stuffed animal near me as I colored. So, there I was coloring. It's probably around 4.30 and my dad and his workers have just gotten back. They're in the garage maybe smoking some weed or having a beer together or something. Apparently a normal routine after a long day at work. My mom was reading or something right by me. My brother was a few houses down the street with his friend and his family who we'd grown close with. 
All of a sudden, my dad comes rushing through the back door, yelling, Get out of the house! Grab her and get out now! Go! Run to the neighbor's house! I was scared and confused. My mom jumped up as did I. I was grateful my stuffed animal was close by. I grabbed it, and we run out the front door to the neighbor's. It was chilly and my mom and I were barefoot. We fly up our long driveway, and my dad, who I thought was behind us, stalls at the end on the phone, yelling to someone. We get to the neighbor's where my brother is, and we see the cops speed by to our house. We were all so confused. Well, as it turned out, those brothers my dad hired were hiding something. The dorky one with the glasses was extremely mentally ill, and he'd just gone off his meds. He, his brother, and his family were too embarrassed to mention that apparently smoking weed and drinking alcohol was a trigger for him. That evening, when the employee smoked weed and had a beer after that job, they failed to notice that he'd gone to his car to grab a rifle and started shooting all over the place, especially at the wood piles, which I would have normally been playing on, and into the garage where my dad's employees were. He also shot at all the cars and left bullet holes in many of the workers' and tenants' vehicles. The workers ran into the attached apartment to the garage with that couple living there. During this, my dad ran as fast as he could to the house to save my mom and me. My dad's badass friend who happened to live in the apartment grabbed his hunter rifle and ran down to the garage area while the employees hid in his shower. He saw the shooter jump in his car with his gun and was about to speed off. My dad's friend took his own rifle, broke the shooter's car window, and grabbed the gun out of his hands. The shooter took off down our long driveway. Gotta say, I'm glad my mom and I weren't running down that driveway when he was speeding out at full speed. The cops caught him very quickly just down the street, opposite end of the street where we hid. He was arrested and my parents didn't press charges since no one was seriously hurt. They were more upset that this all could have just been avoided had someone mentioned that he was mentally ill. My dad doesn't run background checks. He'll just pay whoever is willing and needed the cash. Shady, I'm well aware. Also, something I literally just learned tonight. The day prior to the shooting, my brother had a weird encounter with the shooter. He was at a gas station with our neighbor. My dad's worker pulls up and offers them a ride home. Literally a three-minute car ride. They agree because they know and recognize him. They note that he was strangely wearing black nail polish and his hood was up, which wasn't normal of him. We think now it maybe had something to do with him being off his meds. Maybe it was just a coincidence though. Who knows? I'm 25 now and I remember the experience vividly. I hope I'll never hear my dad's voice with that tone ever again. It was so scary. I still don't know how I didn't hear the gunshots though. My mom believed because we lived very close to a gun range, we may have just grown accustomed to the sound nearby. So to give some context before I tell my story, I'm a 28-year-old married woman. I live in a major city with a somewhat established and successful career that I run from home. It involves several medium art forms that get messy, so due to my daytime responsibilities, I work outside a lot at night. I live right next to a gas station. The entirety of my property is wrapped in a privacy fence, except for the very front. I'm in a decent neighborhood as well, but kind of on the fringe. The story starts in mid-March this year. Once in a great while, I'll walk to the bar diagonal from my house. It's a nice little place, great regulars, all older, not too gross. I can just go in, drink, and talk, and never have to worry about them hitting on me or being weird. It's a Friday night at around 9.30. I decide to walk over to the bar to have a few drinks. I'm not a super jumpy person, but I am always cautious and aware of my surroundings. When I left the bar, the first thing I noticed was this very tall guy across the street under a lamp face and body obscured by a ball cap and hoodie. I'm usually under the assumption that someone hanging under a light is waiting to do a drug deal because that's the hip thing around here. I just casually glanced at him every minute or so as I walked by. It's less than a two minute walk from the bar to my house. I can see my house from the bar, so nothing super treacherous, right? I got into the spot on the road I cross at 
when I glance at the guy because I can feel him staring me down. I wasn't going to give him any reason to sense any nervousness or fear though, so I just kept walking. As soon as I get to the same side of the road that he's on, he starts catcalling me. Hey girl, come here. Let's talk. Don't ignore me, baby. I just want to talk. Quit walking away so fast. I didn't respond. He started walking toward me, cutting through the gas station parking lot diagonally. Luckily, once I passed my fence, he couldn't see me anymore. I ran up my steps and got inside and locked up. He came to the edge of the fence, then walked back to where he was standing. I was shaken up, but I let it go and went to bed. The weeks pass by and I'm still cautious, but I still go to the bar once in a while. No sign of him the entire time. Fast forward to the weekend before last. I walked over on a Sunday night at around 10 p.m. The first thing I notice as I pass my fence walking to the bar is that man standing under the lamp again. He didn't seem to notice me at first, not until I crossed onto the opposite side. I could feel him staring at me, but there were no calls, no movement, other than his face following me as I walked. I didn't fret over it too much. I planned to only be at the bar about two hours. I had my drinks, chat with my buddies, all is well. As I go to leave though, that guy pops back into my head. I decided if he was still there, I'd have the bartender walk out with me and watch me walk home. He's a sweetheart like that and always offers. I usually decline because I usually don't feel unsafe. I step out and do a full 360 visual sweep. No weirdo under the light. Off in the distance though, I could see someone was walking toward the bar, but they were a full block away. I couldn't make out anything about the person, so I figured, whatever, I'm going to go ahead and walk home. Just for the sake of common sense though, I'll turn around and keep an eye. I wasn't feeling threatened though, as they were pretty far away, and my house was only a half block away. As I'm walking though, I start feeling weird. I turn and check the location of the strange, unidentifiable person. They've covered half a block already in about 10 seconds. I'm unsure now if they were just walking super fast, or they were running when I wasn't looking. This weird little tension gets thicker until I'm basically staring behind myself at them as I walk. By the time I get to my crossing point, they had already gotten to the bar entrance. They covered a full block in less than 20 seconds, and I had only been half a block in that time. As they passed in front of the bar, the light lit them up. It was the same guy who was under the lamp earlier that evening. I was worried now, because I was trapped between my house and the bar, but unable to go back as the guy was now in front of it. My only real option was to finish walking home. Now if I had any doubt about the situation and thought maybe I was being paranoid, it was completely erased by what transpired next. As soon as I started crossing the street, so did he. He stepped off the sidewalk and started making a diagonal beeline right for me. I started walking faster, but not fast enough to lead him to chase. He got to the gas station parking lot, which I was halfway past at this point. He walked diagonal through it, booking it right at me. As soon as I got around my fence, I bolted and started banging on my door. My husband was home at the time, so he opened it. I told him what happened, and we stood there staring out the door window. As he walked past my house, he stared up through the window at us. It was my first time fully seeing his face. Now, there's still a possibility that maybe he just lives around here and I was just being paranoid. But that was completely stopped out by his next move, which was to walk two more houses down from mine, turn around completely and walk back by my house, and stare into the window at me again, then proceed back out onto the main road. The bar isn't a concern. As stated, my bartender will gladly watch me walk home, and the regulars offer to walk me home often as well. My biggest concern is he now knows where I live, and I'm terrified of being outside at night alone when I'm trying to work. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here as always. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you decided to watch this far to the end of the video. If you guys like the content of this video, please be sure to like, share the video, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you do decide to subscribe, make sure to hit that bell button and turn notifications to all, so you can be notified of every video I post in the future. 
Although you can also just stop by every once in a while since I post a video every day, so it'll be hard to miss them. If you guys have any thoughts on the stories or any criticisms on how I can make the video better, please be sure to leave those in the comments below. I always take joy in reading all the comments and trying to respond to as many as possible, so I really appreciate when you leave them. Uh, if you guys want to send in a story yourselves, please be sure to check in the description below the video. You will find links to all of my social media including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Try and send me a message on any of those and I will read them as soon as I am able to and get back to you if I can. If you do decide to send in your own story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is, the type if it has one, and how you would like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to arrange proper formatting and use proper grammar as well, as it makes it easier to read in a video. Also, if you guys enjoy my content, I have two other channels I run as well, where I do monthly disaster documentaries and I do weekly true crime documentaries. Those channels are called Darkest Hour and Mr. Blue Skies respectively. You can find links to those in the description. Please be sure to check those out if you enjoy those kinds of content. Uh, overall though guys, I think that's pretty much it for now. Thank you guys so much for watching and I hope you guys have a great day.